uh, I'm a, a co-founder and chairman of the Trusted IT Alliance. Uh, we've been looking at uh, the convergence of blockchain and IoT for, for a little bit now, for just over two years, uh, looking at what are the opportunities, what does it actually mean when you take 25 billion internet connected devices at the end of this year and start having them communicate to blockchain ecosystems, blockchain networks, and blockchain technologies in general. What does that actually mean? What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? And what's the go-to-market look like? You know, we talk a lot about product market fit in the valley. Well, what about product market sales fit, right? Are there channels to market that we can create or adapt or enhance that will actually create, you know, opportunities? So with me on stage uh, are our panelists, uh, Benjamin from Elrond. Um, Fantastic L1 technology, trying to address scale and performance. Hey. Uh, we've got Jessica Gruppen from uh, Kaleidoscope. Uh, an interesting and very kind of thought-provoking industry analyst. Uh, and, so, <laughs> and so, you know, we wanted to kind of provide, you know, from an outside in or, or maybe an inside out perspective of what this space is interesting, uh, how it's looking and developing. Uh, we've got... Bill Norton. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce Noi. Noi, okay. Noi, Noi Network. Yeah. Uh, uh, Bill is a is an is a, a bit of an internet icon. Uh, you know, one of the uh, co-founders of, of Equinix, one of the largest um, data center providers in the planet. And we've got Rowland from from IoTech, CEO co-founder. Thank you. Uh, looking at a lot of very interesting blockchain and IoT use cases and developing some pretty fascinating technology there. So I wanted to kind of set the stage a little bit. Um, just quickly in general, from your guys' perspective, you know, what does it mean to have blockchain and IoT as a theme, as a product, as a set of services? Uh, what does it mean to opportunities and challenges? Who wants to take that first? Um, I'll, I'll take a whack at it. I think we're still figuring it out, frankly. Um, at least from our research, though, so, so I run a research and advisory firm, and, and we look at a, about 30 different emerging technologies, and I'm really interested in where they come together. Um, so my kind of perspective on blockchain is, is both having looked at blockchain, but also at this convergence, both with AI, machine learning, as well as IoT. And we published a report a couple of years ago on this particular intersection, and, and again, it's very early days. I don't think we can emphasize that enough. Um, but we seek sort of three main... I guess, use cases or, or, or value propositions, if you like, for this particular interplay. Uh, one is around identity. How do we keep track of all these devices and authenticate them and permission them based on you know, changing dynamics, identity? The second is transactions, monetary or otherwise. Um, and then the third is interactions. So as you have people interacting, as you have new data sets interacting, new protocol, new API, whatever the case may be, we don't really have a, a layer today to manage, authenticate, interconnect, or monetize machine-to-machine -machine or, or sort of multi-device IoT business models. This doesn't really exist. And so is blockchain the silver bullet for that or, or distributed ledger technologies? Probably not. Um, but at, at the very least, it provides a lot of new sort of design configurations that we should be thinking about in those three areas. Anyone else want to take that on? Yeah, I definitely agree with her, what, her, what she said. Uh, I think the identity of these uh, devices will be a really big thing in the next probably five to 10 years. Uh, for now, like a human all has an identity, probably from Google, Facebook, probably from government, right? But for devices, there is currently no identity issue, which is commonly ad, uh, accepted globally. So that's kind of a very you know huge ask from this IoT world. Blockchain can help. And in addition to that, I do think like the data processing information storage will be another layer that can be built on top of blockchain, which will also help with IoT a lot. Not sure if you guys see the news today, like Google acquired this like a Fitbit company. Basically, Google knows one more dimension over data, right? So that's why we need maybe the storage and processing um, being like a working a very uh, decentralized way. So, so that's interesting, right? So you've got a massive company that's you know, uh, consuming another company with a massive amount of data. Um, obviously, privacy for individuals is an issue, is a concern. Privacy for machines 
autonomous agents, software agents? Is that going to be a thing, potentially? And then we look at kind of the opportunities, you know, you know, I, I think the bulk of the blockchain space today is looking at you know, scale and performance and trying to address some of these things for people and organizations. But when we talk about 25 billion devices, do we see a new kind of reinvigorated discussion on scale and performance? Thoughts? If I could just chime in, uh, one thing I find fascinating about the uh, Internet of Things is um, in the networking industry, we very often consider these Internet of Things actually Internet of Insecure Things. These are devices that have very low CPU power, a lot of them. Uh, they're really not meant to be updated. There's not a, a whole lot of user interface. Uh, I, I share the hope that um, applying some degree of a support infrastructure like a crypto currency system might provide some degree of assistance, but I also worry a little bit that these insecure devices having access to some technology that could be exploited might make it even easier for hackers to take over an enormous volume of, of types of devices. So th to me, it, it's really kind of an interesting world that we're creating. We're making steps forward into a world that we're not 100% sure we want. So it, to me, I, I find that fascinating. Go ahead. Um, w to, to add a bit on that, uh, I, I would say that what we really need, uh, the key of Internet of Things and then the key of blockchain is being able to, for the first time, transfer value without the need for a trusted third party in an automatic way. So uh, maybe while we'll not be able to iterate the perfect solution from day one, as it has been clear with maybe Bitcoin, Ethereum, and um, some of the projects that we see right now, I do think that we've made some huge steps toward that direction. And for the first time, I think we're crossing a threshold where at least you can have the relevant conversations. It might still be required that you go one or two orders of magnitude beyond in, in terms of performance, but um, having the conversation is uh, something very different than looking at seven or 15 transactions per second as with Bitcoin or Ethereum. So I think, I think you're, what, you're, what you're leading into is um, kind of the gap, I would say, that there is around education, right? Because um, one of the things that we do at the Trusted IT Alliance is we've actually uh, launched a, a series of global design challenges. And in those global design challenges, we say, well, let's bring the innovators, let's bring, you know, the large companies, the startups, let's have them in a con in a conversation with buy side stakeholders. So your potential customers, your potential partners within your ecosystem. Let's propose simple use cases that people can actually understand and appreciate. All right. So we're not talking about synthetics and derivatives, although there are. That is, that is most definitely a, a theme, and even within blockchain and IoT, but taking something like an electric car and paying for energy and parking the car, what does that look like in a multi-blockchain environment where your OEM has selected a wallet of one class of blockchain, yet the automated parking infrastructure is a yet another blockchain technology? How do we make that work? Everyone relates to having to park a car but how do we actually do that? And I think that's one of the things that, as a conversation, is one of the one of the one of the kind of the attributes that we've kind of extracted from those challenges. There is education that is happening on how to do this, best practices. What would you say, kind of, as an industry, we could be doing more, maybe? Could I ask a clarifying question? Are you talking about maybe two separate blockchains, completely independent? Uh, that are operating for maybe completely different purposes. So let's say Jaguar is an example, right? So we had a mobility challenge. We had the, the electric Jaguar. Jaguar chooses their blockchain technology of choice. Siemens parking infrastructure, right? Massive company chooses yet another blockchain of technology of choice. The toll, uh, the, the, the roadside tolls, toll fees, you know, operated and maintained by municipalities may choose yet another blockchain technology. How does this all work? I'm, I'm just not seeing the, the problem. If these are independent yes. systems, then yeah. they don't need to interoperate. Is there an issue I'm missing? Well, well, that that's the conversation, right? Is there interoperability that is needed there? Is there, uh, is, is there or not, 
right? I, th I think the answer is we just don't know, right? Uh, I would say that what's clear is that if these companies would choose different solutions, then the only way this could work is by having a standard and each of the solutions uh, employing a kind of API, some, something that abstracts away beyond the technology layer and then allows communication because otherwise it would in no way make sense. N no one would adopt that kind of technology, especially if you think about states or uh, municipalities or companies, each of them would probably uh, ask first, okay, is it good enough in terms of performance maybe and cost and so forth? And then probably, okay, what is it compatible with? Because it would be uh, uh, really funny for them to uh, order something like that, install it, and then <laughs> not not be able to uh, communicate with any kind of uh, device. Yeah. Yeah, let, let, let's face a fact, right? So basically, we have to combine different technologies to make up great products for people. Blockchain is a great technology, but with blockchain only, there is actually no way, you know, to do like a really fancy stuff. So that's why I think like uh, uh, also like what we're doing is trying to define all these tech stacks from the blockchain identity, smart contract, storage, and processing all the layer up. Like we, we have to define this tech stack. Right, in order to like uh, teach people how to use this thing, uh, and also we have to also define the first instantialization of like the product using our tech stack. Like our camera, I think our Noob Know uh, is a very good example, like how we leverage all the tech stack we have, and to manufacture the first like the home camera. That the first time we realized this idea of data sovereignty, sovereignty, right? Because you know, if you purchase like Google camera, it watches you all the time. It, Google knows whatever happens at your home. With our camera, basically, it means you control everything that happens to you. You control how the data is encrypted up to the cloud, or maybe purchased later. You control, you know, your identity of this device and data. So that's an instantization of this, like the tech stack. Anyway, when these two things are mature enough, we can push them, you know, to some sort of standardization. Uh, organization to make it like a widely adopted. One thing I would add, you ask kind of what what should we what do we need to be doing yeah. better, right? Um, I mean, certainly among our clients, the conversations around, especially in enterprise blockchain, are not even at this level. They're very early. They're very like, why would we do that? We hear all the time, you know, it's a solution looking for a problem. But I mean, a lot of times I spend time explaining to companies, you know, we're in this massive shift right now, very, very kind of big picture view, but really critical for any kind of downstream development or tech stack decisioning design. We're in this big shift right now of kind of material-based economics towards information-based economics, right? Where value is defined not by selling a number of widgets, but it's by how data is used and transferred and shared and accessed by whom at what times. So in that context, you have to, I mean, we hear a lot about like ecosystem-driven business models, right? That's really hard if you're just selling widgets. You're accustomed to manufacturing and selling your widget, that's it. But if you are packaging data, selling data that has all kinds of different, you know, parameters or compliance kind of baked into it, how do you, you really do need that kind of layer to interact with other providers, with other, you know, ecosystem providers. For example, if you're providing a car as a service, you need to have direct interop with insurance, with, with dealership, with retailers, with consumers, parking, da 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 smart city. So just like starting way up here, at why why do we need this missing layer in the first place? Well, we aren't. The business model is fundamentally changing. The access model is fundamentally changing. That's where I <laughs> spend a lot more time than I'd like to. But I think that's where a lot of certainly enterprise decision makers are right now. Yeah, I, I would say just to add to that, I think the whole notion of billing mm -hmm. is changing, yeah. right? Um, you know, everyone's accustomed to getting their bill at the end of the month from a variety of different pri providers. Doesn't blockchain, in theory, allow you to settle in real time, or as close to real time as you Same might want? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So if the notion of billing is changing, then the whole accounting process has to change around all of this, right? So I think that's part of business model innovation that I think is is certainly I think in the blockchain IT space we're a little bit behind on, right? In in other industries, fintech is an example, energy is an example. They're a little bit further ahead in kind of understanding what these what some of these challenges are. Uh, but as we kind of level set. 
you know, on, on why and what are the motivations across these ecosystems, I think it becomes pretty compelling on why we need blockchain. Right? So in terms, of, in terms of the risks that we're seeing right now, I mean, I think my observation in the blockchain IoT space is that it comes in ebbs and flows, right? It's hot, it's not, it's hot, it's not. Um, why do you think that is? What is, is, it, is it risk? Is it, is it, you know, we've seen a lot of pilots and POCs, not a lot of production. What do you think the hesitation is? I would say that, first of all, it's psychology. Uh, we always tend to overestimate the impact of technology short term and then completely underestimate the impact long term. And uh, whatever we do, uh, we do it psychologically. So when everyone gets excited about this new technology that comes out, uh, we're all um, getting our hopes high, investing as much as possible and so forth. And then, um, of course, we discover it takes a bit longer than um, anticipated, that it's a bit harder, and that uh, maybe 10 years down the road, we are still discussing what blockchain is, why it's useful, uh, and it's the common questions that you would say are very clear and easy by, by this point, but it's not that easy for, for most of the people. So I, I would say this is the sort of obvious explanation of why it's always based on the amount of excitement, based on how clear it is for us on how we can use this technology and, and so forth, and then also based on the amount of um, mature technology we have that can really accommodate some of the use cases because there are a few different um, ideas there. First, okay, the excitement was based on the fact that we thought we could do some things that are not actually possible yet. Namely, that you could build all these dApps, use cases, and so forth, and then have real-world adoption on the blockchain. Well, this, uh, as it turns out, is much harder to come by, but what we know at least right now is that without scalability, there's no conversation on how to onboard and um, bring businesses in. So I, I would say there's a new hope coming in. So depression has, has uh, killed a lot of projects and enterprises get scared and so forth, but right now with with more mature technology and a lot of teams putting in the work, I think it will become very, very interesting during the next three to six months to see what solutions appear in the market. And then um, I, I would expect excitement to kick, kick in again, at least for maybe one or two years until maybe we discover that either we're finally ready for a first wave of adoption or we discovered that something else is, is missing. I would bet on adoption. This is, this is what we are focused on, but uh, yeah. So do you think that uh, that uptake is, is three or six months away? I, based on what we are building, um, I see a great excitement from the companies we're discussing with. And I also think that when you can cross a level of at least 10,000 transactions per second with a minimal latency and 1,000 times less uh, smaller cost than what you had uh, uh, before, at least you can have the conversations. They are extremely excited. It's like you see a light in their eyes that they've heard this a lot of times and now they can finally build it. And it's not only about the technology, but also about the tools that you can offer them to onboard them really easy, and then about the, the education and, and documentation. So um, I'm not sure how it will be for the, the rest of the, the uh, space, but if we can see that this works out at least in some respects, uh, I'm sure everybody will rush to reproduce and replicate this. So you're a big proponent that, that one of the roadblocks, and, and if we can solve it, is scale. Solving scale will drive will, will drive adoption. Will drive actually conversion from POC to production environments. Anything else? What do we, what else do we think might be a, a, an enabler of production deployments? I'll throw one in. I mean, 
you're completely, I completely agree with you and, and really just everything that you said. I think this kind of chicken and egg problem of we don't have the scalability that we need and so therefore the POCs are not getting off the ground and so therefore other companies aren't investing because they don't have something to benchmark against and they haven't seen another company who's gone into pilot and production. That's just sort of a self-fulfilling <laughs> cycle. Um, I think we really underestimate this education gap too, plus the psychology, as you said. I mean, not only is not only uh, you know has sort of the the crypto market and its volatility kind of hijacked the the broader long tail of blockchain use cases in the mainstream, such as it is, awareness of blockchain, um, but that's quickly picked up by decision makers when. By the way, blockchain's hard to understand. For most people, this is complicated. <laughs> um, it doesn't have that sort of crazy, sexy element that you know AI or deep learning has, where you know they start to they start to understand it a little bit easier. You know, I could contradict myself on that too. But generally speaking, when you have a really complicated technology to to understand again in that broader high context and then you're sort of bombarded by this volatility by just the the sort of crypto reputation unfortunately um, it's not to, not to say that this is accurate but i think that that pollutes the the perceived understanding that some of these decision makers have it, to me one thing i find fascinating uh, coming from the networking industry um, you know, we always talk about disruptive technologies, and um, I, I, I tell you, I, I think the, the cryptocurrency, the blockchain in environment has uh, much more disruption, and the, the example I usually give is, well, if your technology is so disruptive, how many of your industry icons have served jail time? I mean, isn't that the ultimate indication that something is disruptive? Someone got pissed off enough to put them in jail. I don't know of any internet icons that have served jail. Do you know? Um, um, uh, uh, Bernie maybe. Ebers. Uh, that's that's right. Yeah. But is that okay? Anyway, he's not really an icon. He's just a criminal. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but no, I, I I do believe that a lot of things are heading in the right direction. Uh, getting the regulatory framework cleared up, getting so those of us who work in this space can actually draw a paycheck. You know, all these things add in increased uh, certainty and will help people get more uh, comfortable with it. I might be an outlier on this panel, but I believe that the cryptocurrency and the blockchain stuff really should be plumbing underneath the floor that no one has to ever think about or have to, you know, uh, consider. I, I'm, I'm saying that coming from, uh, from Noya, we have a utility token token you can actually use to buy better internet connectivity. So that there's a, a real use case there. You spend it uh, when you want to get a better internet connection. You, you earn it when you're providing a better internet connection for others. Um, that really doesn't need to be all that upfront and in your face unless you're in the current market where you're a speculator and you're doing this because you want to earn coins. You're doing this because you want to get into cryptocurrency, but you don't want to have to pull out your real wallet and pay with US dollars. So I, I think it's a, it's a really interesting area, but education, absolutely. This is a brand new technology. It's scary. Will I go to prison? Will I get arrested if I use this thing? Uh, all that has to go under the table. I think we're maybe a couple years out. Uh, the other thing, you know, Internet of Things, um, you, you're talking about so many billions of devices, low power devices. I also kind of want to question, is that really the place that you want to connect in cryptocurrency into, or is there more of an orchestration layer that is a more appropriate place to put uh, that, that type of functionality? So, so I heard a couple of themes. One is, let's keep it simple. Yes. And I think with blockchain, IoT, and just I would say in infrastructure in general, we can keep it simple. Yeah. Um, but I haven't seen that yet, right? And, and I've been at this five years. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out how to keep it simple. So, so what what do we think is 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 kind of the resistance to that simplification? Is it the is it the kind of the much louder conversation of of other applications of blockchain that is kind of you know, kind of overpowering something we might be doing in infrastructure in IoT? Just, just I would say three words: distributed is hard. Yeah, I think everyone would agree with that. Yeah, I think it's all about like um, uh, definitely education. Another dimension could be like a very good 
uh, awareness actually created by like a very good product among the users, which demonstrates values, right? Like why people like social network? Because it brings values to us. It makes it like a communication with the, like loved ones, interested ones easier. So I think like what we, like basically Bitcoin demonstrates usefulness, but we need another one in the IoT world plus blockchain to demonstrate this one is really useful in terms of maybe give you, you know, uh, maybe uh, you know, more privacy or maybe more freedom of your data or maybe even something else. So once user gets used to this kind of feeling, then I feel like the IoT blockchain will like it's, uh, really take off. So, so you know, we, we didn't discuss this earlier, but uh, is, is blockchain the killer app for 5G or the other way around? I think they will accelerate one another. I'm not sure if one is a killer app. I mean, yeah, but I think they have a mutually accelerating relationship. I, I, I would say coming back to your other question that sort of the, there's a discussion right now and the challenge is because blockchain involves so many different technologies and could be described in so many different ways, the problem is that you don't have an, a sort of very compelling narrative that you can use everywhere. The, the, the minute you have something like that, you can stick it in the mind of someone and you can repeat it constantly and so forth. So because we don't have this type of clarity um, and th this is why we sort of do not move forward and, and explain things, educate people, but I would move one step further and say we don't have this type of clarity yet because there are a few different hypotheses where we say, okay, scalability is probably the most important obstacle, but uh, we understand that it's upon us to prove this, to build a better solution to then go and take uh, capture part of the market and deliver a solution that really solves an important problem for the, the companies and then uh, then redefine what blockchain really is. Because Vitalik, when he, he invented um, Ethereum, tried to dodge this question of what the killer app of blockchain is, saying that, okay, but uh, this might be a useful narrative of explaining technology, but it might not be fit for blockchain technology because you might not necessarily immediately have a killer application. What I would say is we are very close to seeing the killer applications because uh, as with the internet, when you only had dial up, you could do very, very few things. O of course, you could do some, at least some, you did have some killer applications uh, there as well. But when you had uh, the transition from dial-up to broadband, at that point, everything blew off. So I, I would expect the same to happen uh, with, with blockchain. And then you'll probably see ramifications with cryptocurrency stuff happening, continuing, like decentralized finance and, and so forth. And then uh, this layer where you abstract away the whole technical part and just put in blockchain as part of a more uh, broader solution for something. So do you think machines can participate in DeFi? Surely, well, uh, but uh, let's let's make the question. What is DeFi? Uh, no, <laughs> yeah, that that's, <laughs> yeah, but, but what, in what way do you mean? Do you mean in any kind of way possible that cars would uh, rent themselves Cars can rent themselves. We know that autonomous vehicles are on their way. Mm -hmm. We know that autonomous vehicles will hold units of value. Sure. They can charge and pay sure. for charging. They can get paid for services delivered. Yeah. Can they participate in microloans? Yeah, Should for they? sure, right? So basically, I think uh, what we're building is trying to like a backbone for the machines, for the devices in the future. Um, and they are actually should be like a stake to provide some type of services, like you're saying. Uh, no matter what, serve people, maybe serve other machines. And also micropayments might be happening all the time, you know, non nonstop. And also some other like uh, economical elements. I'm sure there are lots of things, you know, if you want to define this as a DeFi, that, that's definitely like a machine economics. So you heard it here, folks. Machines and DeFi, that'll happen first. With that, we're out of time. Thank you. <laughs>
Thanks. Thank you for that great panel. I, I want my electric car to buy a MakerDAO into a MakerDAO CDP. So. <laughs> um, um, so thank you to our panel once again. Uh, I think we have time for a few questions maybe even, if, if there are questions in the audience. Yeah, we've got one. If you don't tell, if you don't ask a question, I'm going to have to tell a joke. <laughs> <laughs> one second. I knew it was this one. <laughs> Hi. So f regarding IoT and blockchain, um, do you see any trend emerging where, um, like, the wallets or the blockchain technology are put on like the home hub or like hub or Nest that are actually like part of the central hub for the home where they can start collaborating. And there's also like another use cases that I saw is like people have these wireless camera out there where they will share footage to fight crime. So it's like a community alert of things that's combining these IoT devices um, for the community. Um, do you see any trend emerging or happening um, like in the near future or recently that will kind of like help push this forward? Thank you. Sure. Uh, I'd only add a few points on this. Uh, we were actually discussing with someone about this um, last year. Uh, there was a startup in Germany trying to provide an energy metering solution in uh, different houses and so forth. And the fascinating thing was that they were trying to implement, uh, add a hardware for running nodes in this meter that they would install in, in, in the houses of people. So uh, you could easily understand why they were trying to do this because um, they, they wanted an energy solution that could be um, tested out on blockchain, could rent some of the energy they had and so forth. But the really interesting point was that once you have a wallet and a node and uh, the infrastructure built inside, then you can do a, a lot uh, more things. And they were trying to sell this to different networks, uh, and you could start uh, seeing some uh, a very interesting approach to bootstrapping a network, decentralizing it, making sure that blockchain is part of the ecosystem in a very, very silent manner. I, I would say that when we start considering applications or use cases that are in the home or in the neighborhood, privacy becomes a massive issue that I don't think we've really solved for yet. So in the in the event of lawful intercept, right, who gets, who, who, who is, the warrant, is the warrant served to? The device, the owner, the manufacturer? I think these are, these are you know, issues that we, I think we need to still uncover what are the nuances and then potentially what are the solutions. Any other questions? Hey, um, before I ask my question, I just want to say, Please don't put uh, cameras in your home that automatically give the footage to the cops. That's just dystopian. It's really not the future that we want to build. Um, my question is, a lot of IoT devices, uh, the pricing model is you pay for the device upfront with you know, possibly an optional um, internet service attached to that you, that you pay for monthly or, or yearly or what have you. Um, do you see this pricing model changing as we move towards uh, things like micropayments on IoT, is it is it possible that we'll uh, kind of in the vein of, of free to play games with microtransactions, uh, could we have you know free to own uh, IoT devices that then perform microtransactions on the user's behalf? Yeah, so we did like some uh, actually very very, very uh, interesting POCs on top of this. There are two things we experimented. So first thing is like as a user, you don't have to or maybe device, you don't have to pay for the po pay for something, right? For example, electricity, you can stake a certain amount of coin, which generates like an interest, like an interest based off the electricity, for example, that's one. Another interesting POC we have is uh, like a machine serve another machine to get paid. For example, like you have this TV, maybe you're not watching all the time, so you can rent it out. Uh, it's kind of like a concept of fragmental ownership. Then the, the TV, just put it there. TV may, might be a very bad example. Maybe a bike or maybe a car can earn you some like a passive income. That's another interesting one we did. Yeah, the, the equipment leasing and finance industry is looking at this very, very closely. Um, if you look at the amount of the volume of construction equipment that is just sitting around, 
are on a train waiting to go somewhere is 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 pretty huge right so that's there's devices appliances machinery that's not being utilized so if it's just sitting there it's not making somebody money and so uh, that industry is looking very closely to how do we kind of create a an on demand uh, on demand uh, payment and consumption model yeah I mean to that point anywhere where there's underutilized resources yeah. there's opportunity for business model disruption <laughs> exactly yeah. exactly okay. one more question Going once. Oh, there we go. Good panel, guys. Um, so my question is, if we are all in this room because we believe blockchain and IoT mean something, right? IoT generates the data, blockchain adds trust to it. But it's still, you know, that's such a simple concept, but consumers are taking a long time to catch on. So what is the path to making them understand that this is not as complicated as it needs to be. Um, this is more on the cultural side of things, right? As we develop out the technology, how do you fix the societal and cultural uh, implications of this? We'll stay that one on. To, to the first question, um, I would say we just need to prove it once. If we can prove it that it works with some particular use case, then you can easily make the case that this is it. Uh, but unless you can prove, it always becomes this um, uh, problem of describing too much, uh, having to um, explain away all the problems that have come in the past, why the technology had not worked, what, why other proof of concepts have not worked, and so forth. So I, I see that if companies like us find a way to have the technology ready, have a very clear crystal clear documentation so that the companies can can uh, uh, on board and then also make sure that you offer the support in order to um, take the proof of concept from day one to implementation and show that you can add real value to the business uh, then all the other stuff are details uh, they were s sort themselves out of course they require effort but um, if you cannot prove the first part then uh, there's no um, interesting explanation or interesting story to talk about. I kind of think of this in the in the in terms of the smart home, where that industry continues to struggle, but struggled for a long time to get over the 10% mark, um, thanks to or at least attributed to smart speakers. Um, that's now 25, 35, depending kind of how you measure adoption. And that's not because people understand consumer IoT or smart home devices. Um, there's utility there. Where I think there is uh, a vast opportunity, and maybe we just have to get it once right, right once, uh, is around trust, right? And so that's device trust, in-home trust, telco trust, you know, fill in the blank. But uh, there's a big crisis of trust uh, from the consumer standpoint of all kinds of powerful entities, technology, government, and otherwise. And so that to me is sort of the, the holy grail, not so much can people better understand IoT. Yeah, I would agree. I think that's the holy grail. I'm Personally, I'm not convinced that retail will be the first place that blockchain and IoT comes to fruition. I think it's on the industrial and, and enterprise side, uh, but time will tell. Thank you. Thank you for that fantastic panel. Please give them a warm round of applause.